I grew up in Quincy, just south of Boston, in a, a housing project there. And my aunt uh, rented a small, really tiny cottage for us, for my family, my mother, my t two sisters and me, um, in just over the line in East Ham on the Cape. And I knew from a very early age what the difference was between um, a city type sit uh, situation, kind of a beach, which was not really pristine, and the beautiful beaches of the Cape. And so I knew very, very early the difference between those two. I don't know, it was sort of instinctive for me. And then um, I graduated from, I knew e even at an early age also that I wanted to live on the Cape. And so I graduated from uh, University of Massachusetts in Amherst and after graduation sort of made a beeline for Orleans and lived there for my entire adult life until just recently when I moved to Duxbury, which is now, out off the Cape and just south of Boston. I, I knew about the water. It was one of those things that I knew really early on. Um, I was playing in the sand like most people do on the flats of Cape Cod Bay uh, when, we, when we were forced to stay on the beach for that hour after lunch. You know, back in the day when you, know, you just couldn't go swimming after, right after lunch, it just had to stay on the beach. At any rate, um, I was digging in sand pools and looking at the shells and all that, all that kind of thing. I was just, I was very interested in the water. I was under the water more than on top of the water a lot of times. My mother produced uh, multicolored bathing caps for us and kept saying, you know, Janet, Susan, where's Sandy? Where's Sandy? Where's Sandy? <laughs> she couldn't find me because I was underwater, just swimming, you know, through people's legs, doing handstands, doing all those kind of thing, kid things. So the water was part of me from a very, very early age. Um, I learned to swim from a friend of my mother, my aunt's, uh, son sort of took us under his wing and taught me to swim when I was, I don't know, maybe in the third grade or something like that. And then I went to camp for two weeks and I really learned how to swim and that set me off for my path. Um, in about junior high school, I think it was, the Jack Cousteau specials were on and that did it for me. That I, that's what I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to work with the marine resources in some capacity, one way or another. And so at UMass, they, they, I went to. I graduated in 1971, and 1970 was the first Earth Day, so it hadn't really gotten traction at that point. Um, and so I took a sort of a um, independent study for the last year and a half that I was at UMass that got me into some of the policy and ecology courses that weren't available originally, and they were going to have a major in exactly what I wanted. Uh, which was conservation of natural resources, but it wasn't going to be in effect until after I graduated. So I did this independent study on my own. And then when I moved to Orleans, I didn't find anything right away. Everybody wanted to volunteer and I needed a paying job. And so I worked at a grocery store, I worked as a waitress, um, and I worked in retail for a little while too, trying to figure out what I was going to do. And then one day I heard that the selectmen were going to have a meeting about shellfishing in Pleasant Bay. And I had been trying to keep my ear to the pavement to see if something was going on, and so I went to the meeting. And the fishermen were very upset that there had not been a new set of quahogs in Pleasant Bay for years. There had been a set back in the um, 50s and 60s that had finally played out, that, that they, just, they just weren't reproducing in the bay. And they wanted to know why. And there was somebody said, well, there's a biologist sitting in the back of the room, why don't we hire her? Next thing I knew, the shellfish constable came and asked me if I wanted a job. And so on a contract basis, I worked for the shellfish department for six months trying to figure out what was going on in Pleasant Bay. And that contract got extended for another six months. And so they couldn't give me any help, really. And so I was basically on my own. I had to um, borrow a boat from my then boyfriend. My uh, future brother-in-law made a mini bull rake for me and with a, I think it was a 20 foot pole on the end of it. And to make it more difficult for myself, I lined that with quarter inch hardware cloth because I needed to see what the sentiment was. I did samples all over the bay, not having a clue what I was really doing. And I, I just, I just was doing it. I'd never, I'd never shellfished before. I'd never raked quahogs. And there I am in Pleasant Bay in 12 feet of water with this ridiculous situation of me in this boat trying to to anchor it, bow and stern, whatever that meant, and finally doing it. And anyway, 
this one of the fishermen, most of the fishermen had gone because they're there early in the morning and I was still working at the grocery store and so I couldn't go until the afternoon when the southwest wind came up so I was fighting that going to my workplace. At any rate, I did that and this one fisherman came over and he said, I can't stand it any longer. He said, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you here? I told him what I was doing, and he taught me how to bull rig, and I'm forever grateful to him. So I did that, and then my, my boss um, extended the contract for another six months, and then he went to the selectmen and said, we should have this as a full-time position. And so I became the uh, first um, full-time shellfish biologist in, for a municipality in Massachusetts. Uh, East Ham, I think, was the next one to have a biologist for a full-time um, and then a couple of other towns had people on board who were full-time. So it sort of gradually grew for people who had some, some background in this to get their, you know, to be in the, in the shellfish departments. Um, but as far as women are concerned, there was a, a shellfish constable in Chatham when I first started. Her name was Cass Abreu. And she and I were the only women in the shellfish world of Massachusetts for years, and so we'd, we'd go to these conferences, and um, the old timers, especially for me, they just said, you know, you don't know what you're talking about, and uh, roll their eyes when I was saying anything. Um, but eventually, it, they, they came along and came on board, and now I think the Mass Shellfish Office Association is somewhere around 50-50. Um, so wow. it's, it's been quite a, quite a uh, thrill for me to watch the um, increase in women in this business and, and also the scientific community, I mean, scientific organizations that I belong to is the same thing that a lot more women have gone into marine resources. So it's, it's been, it's really, really been thrilling to watch all of that. So yeah. I'd probably say they're there for their own reasons, but I think that there is a common thread of trying to protect the re marine resources. Mm -hmm. I think the protection is probably paramount for those of us in it. And when I first started, um, like I said, I was you know, looking at the natural selection in, in Pleasant Bay, but the um, hatcheries came, became commercially uh, viable. And that was something that came into being in the late 60s. And they became uh, commercially, like I said, viable uh, financially. Um, and so we were able to buy seed cohogs from hatcheries um, the next year after I started, or the first year I started really full time. And that was a boon to us because then we could start to try and give back to Mother Nature by buying this, this hatchery stock. However, the first year we were getting stock from North Carolina, it was the only hatchery that we knew about. And so we ordered a, a very small amount because we had so many questions. Nobody knew whether any of this was going to work, whether they were going to survive a plane ride from North Carolina to Massachusetts, whether they were going to survive in our waters in the summer, whether they were going to make it through our winters, whether they were going to be winter kill after the winters, would they survive the next year, would they, would they spawn, would they help? I mean, all of these things. And um, we had no answers. Nobody, nobody knew whether this was going to work. And so we bought, I think it was, um, 10,000 and you know really small amount and because I didn't want to put all my eggs in one basket and because Orleans has three separate estuaries I put them in small frames in uh, 10 different locations a thousand per location to test this out because I at that point I didn't even know what the resources were in town I was looking around for them I was trying to do my walking the shores and finding out what was where and what was what basically but I still didn't know and, and didn't know whether they would grow in certain areas, whether if there were um, other cohogs around there, whether that was good or, or whether that would help. Um, if there weren't any cohogs, would they survive in an area that was kind of barren? I mean, all these questions. And so we, um, we, we, we did that. And, and actually, um, I went to my first, well, my first scientific meeting was with the New England Estuarine Research Society. And I found out what they were all about. And the second meeting, they were holding it in Woods Hole. And they had a, not a policy, but the way that they ran it, they wanted research in, in works, works in progress, not necessarily finished work. In fact, they really didn't want the finished work. They wanted in progress. So I had all these questions, and I thought, ah, oh, this is great. I can go to Woods Hole. I can find out all these answers to all these questions. 
So I gave my presentation of what we had done and the, the 10 places that we put the co-hugs and what we had found so far. And then I had this list of questions. And when I finished, there was dead silence. And I thought, uh oh. <laughs> Okay, so the, the second year, after that, the first initial year, because we had success in some areas, we expanded the program greatly. And we still had the um, b bottom boxes that we, that we built. Um, but George Souza was the shellfish constable in Falmouth. And there was an oil spill in 1969 in West Falmouth Harbor. And he um, and Arnie Carr from the state of Massachusetts did experiments with hatchery seed. And then um, Arnie put them in, in like uh, bread boxes and, and lined them and put them um, floating in the water. And George had floating sandbox rafts, which he built, and then and they had flotation on them. And they were huge. And the, the rafts were working really well. Um, and, and backtrack to one of the things, that, one of the great things about the shellfish departments on the Cape and in Massachusetts is that we all shared information at meetings. And it was nothing that was that was proprietary, it was just this big sharing going on. At any rate, we had heard about these floating sandboxes and my boss said that sounded like a, a really good idea. So we built ones that were half the size of that and we filled them with 25,000 seed cohogs a piece and they worked marvelously. The seed grew like crazy, there was almost no predation, there was no, almost no mortality. It was, just, it was just wonderful and so we did that for several years and still did the bottom culture and then figure out the bottom culture for us wasn't working very well. So we stuck to the rafts for a while. And then the um, inflation was really bad. And so we looked at that situation and said, I wonder if it would be better for us to um, try to build our own hatchery. And so East Ham, Orleans, um, who else was in the hatchery? I can't remember for the early, early part of that. Uh, put buildings together and and try to do our own thing with hatcheries. And they were pretty um, um, rustic, shall we say. And so it, it really didn't work that well for, for me, that's for sure. Um, but what we did the, the next year was that a new technique came along from a conference that was held in Belgium. And the technique is called an upweller. And that made it um, a whole lot easier because then we could buy small seed from a commercial hatchery and we could grow that up to something that could be plantable and then go from there and so we didn't have to go through the getting the animals to spawn and and getting and d growing the well we grew algae anyway but we didn't have to go through the spawning process which is you, you lose a lot in that whole process um, we didn't have to do that we could just buy the small seed and that worked beautifully for a number of years um, and we were able to grow a million seed a year in a little building that was um, across from the Goose Hummock Shop in Orleans. And it, it re does require a flowing seawater system, which is 24-7, um, and things can go wrong with that. But the, the technique itself works really beautifully because you can put a lot of cohogs in a small area and get them to grow. They don't grow anywhere near as fast as oysters, but they do, they do make it, and, it, and they, uh, it's... It's, uh, it was a boon to all the towns, and now just about every town has an upweller facility that they use for the public fishery before they can they buy seed and then get it out to the fishery, but they use the upweller first as a first step. Um, we, were, we were very happy with what was going on with the shellfish, but the development on the Cape was starting to rear its head. And we got a letter, I don't remember what year it was, that one of our major ponds was closed to shell fishing until further notice. And he said, we, we were shocked, absolutely shocked with that. And it was because of road drainage primarily, but it was bacterial contamination. And so we, we developed a water quality task force, uh, started doing water samples, um, finally got a um, um, article through town meeting to hire somebody to find out what the problem was and what could be done about it and then went forward with um, drains in town, five major drains that we, we tried to fix first with leaching fields and digging up the roads and putting those in. And then the nutrient um, problem surfaced and people in Woods Hole, MBL, um, um, uh, URI in, in Rhode Island, 
um, universities all over the place were finding out about the nutrient enrichment problem that was coming mainly from groundwater um, and mainly from septic systems and um, surface water is a problem as well with the road drainage and uh, fertilized lawns and all of that going into the water but the main culprit is our septic systems since we don't have any other way of treating our wastewater. Um, so that has been a, a 25 year at more uh, project to try and get all of that fixed on Cape Cod and because it's a sole source aquifer we need to figure out what's going on beneath our feet. So I got involved in that with committee work and, and then eventually my shellfish program was um, d uh, dropped basically and I moved to the, shelf to the conservation department and as the conservation administrator. And I knew that as much as I was supposed to be looking at wetlands from a landowner's point of view and from the town's point of view to, to protect the land with the Wetlands Protection Act, that I couldn't do anything about helping the shellfish unless I looked at the land also because what was happening on the land was uh, also affecting the shellfish and it didn't make any sense to grow a ton of shellfish if it wasn't going to work in the larger scheme of things. So that's where I put a lot of my effort as well as trying to marry these two. So what has happened since then, since I retired, I, I was asked by the Friends of Pleasant Bay right after I retired to give their um, a talk for their annual meeting. And they asked me to give a retrospective. And so I, gave, I went through basically this, what I've just talked about. And I had maybe 13 um, points that I was trying to make of what had happened in my whole career. And um, when I got to the, to the environmental things of the water quality, it was things that they hadn't really heard about, uh, putting it all together, they hadn't really heard about. And so they asked me if I could write it, and I said, well, sure. So I wrote a 40-page expansion of the talk that was dull and boring, and they said, well, that's fine, but we were thinking of a book. I said, oh, well, that's something I've never done before. And a gentleman stepped forward who had a 30-year career at the Boston Globe as an editor and a writer, and he said, I'll help you. And so the result of that was this book that the Friends of Pleasant Bay um, published, which is uh, Rowing Forward, Looking Back. And it tracks what happened in Orleans over about 30 years of high development and what happened to the shellfish and the estuaries where the shellfish live. And so that came first. And then um, a, f a fisherman came up to me who, with whom I had basically butted heads for 30 years. and. Um, asked me about um, whether I would help him get his stories out and he he fished offshore at a very important time in the fishing industry which was between um, seat of the pants uh, fishing with just um, a lead line uh, a compass a chart and a watch basically um, to figure out where they were and how they could read the bottom with the lead line and uh, come back you know to show when they were out of sight of land. Anyway, he, he wanted me to get his stories out and in a weak moment I said yes because I knew that this was a really important time of the industry between, like I said, seat of pants and electronics. There was no electronics on board. They were just doing it, you know, offhand. So that was the second book and that was called Tiggy, The Law and Lore of Commercial Fishing in New England. And then for some reason, I decided to go further and sort of put all of all, all of this together, but in a broader context of not just Cape Cod, but Cape Cod as a, an example of what is going on elsewhere. And because Cape Cod um, is sticking out 40 miles into the Atlantic, there's an awful lot of things that have that are germane to the Cape that aren't happening other pla other places. And the Cape has always been considered a biogeographic boundary between northern waters and southern waters, and so it, it's always been an important place. A lot of things have happened, so I put that together in the third book, which is Swirling Currents, <laughs> and that's that takes into consideration things like whales and the fish and shark um, and seal debate and shellfish and fisheries in general, and it's all under the umbrella of climate change. And so I've, what I've tried to do is give the, the history of all of those things and how they interact, how those species interact with each other 
and how we interact with them and they interact with us and putting that all together in one place. One of the things that that I've tried to do with basically with swirling currents but with um, everything that I've done is to try to connect the dots between things and when you look at something like the strandings in Cape Cod Bay we are in the top three in the world for marine animal strandings and that does not include the turtles and there's hundreds and hundreds of turtles that get st stranded every single year and the um, uh, Wellfleet Audubon is the, the first, like their first responders basically for these turtles. And they have volunteers that go out in some of the most miserable weather in late October on a high tide with a harsh northwest wind blowing and fiercely at high tide and the, the waves, it's just, it's a miserable time. They go out both at the high tide during the day and the high tide at night and search the, the shores for stranded turtles which they can then um, protect a little bit on the beach until they get help from Wellfleet. And then Wellfleet, other volunteers, drive them up to Quincy to a laboratory and, a, and a, basically a hospital that is run by the New England Aquariums. And then they do a lot of rehabilitation to those turtles. And some of them they airlift to other hospitals all over the East Coast. And then eventually the ones that, that survive that, and a lot of them do survive, get reintroduced into the water again. So that is a huge, huge project, but it's also a sign of the importance of Cape Cod. The other one that is coming up fast is that the increase in uh, great white sharks makes Cape Cod one of the top two in the world for the aggregation of white sharks. So those are just two examples of what Cape Cod is all about. The third one is right whales, where half the population of the world shows up in Cape Cod Bay almost every single year and has done for a long time now, where these very highly, highly endangered right whales feed in Cape Cod Bay before they move further north. And so, so Cape Cod is extremely important for the whales as well. So Cape Cod has this, has this um, um, place in the world that is that is just incredible and when I wrote Swirling Currents I couldn't get a, a publisher to look at it because they thought it was too Cape centric and I'm thinking I, I'm trying to tell you that yes it is Cape centric but Cape Cod is an example of what's going on elsewhere but it happens to be it happens to be important there's nothing <laughs> nothing I can do about it it happens to be important for all of these different reasons so at any rate um, that's a story of, of why the environment here is so incredible but needs such protection and why everybody comes for beaches but there is so much more to the Cape than just the beaches and because I'm so um, involved with the water side of it I, I see things that other people don't pay that much attention to because I, I, I try to connect all of these dot, dots all the time and it's, um, it's been a very interesting journey for me to go from not knowing anything and bull raking out in Pleasant Bay to um, what I've done since that time. It's been, it's been a wonderful journey and I'm, I'm very, very grateful for everything that has is, that is befallen me to, to help me along the way and all the people that have helped me. Um, and they're just so numerous and, and they're everywhere, um, all over the place. I've, I've just gotten tremendous support from what I've been doing. Um, I can say I can say unequivocally no that they have not been always on board, um, and part of that is when you're talking about um, shellfish and the the part of shellfish of why shellfish are no longer harvested or harvestable. It's because of, of one bacterial contamination. A bacterial contamination would be something, anything from a warm-blooded animal, bacteria that, that the shellfish are ingesting from any warm-blooded animal, including us, but not limited to us. So any bird flying overhead or, or a squirrel crossing the road is going to add to that loads, which is why road drainage is so important for the bacterial contamination. But when you get to, uh, and that's a, that is a public health hazard because you can get sick with gastroenteritis with the bacterial contamination or there could be worse things with red tide type things which I haven't gotten into. Um, however, when you get to the nutrient enrichment, 
that is something that is an environmental um, issue and it's not affecting us directly. So because it doesn't affect us directly, it's not a, a health hazard per se, um, people sort of say, yeah, that would be great to fix it, but then when you talk about what it's going to cost to fix it, it's all of a sudden, oh, well, you know, we don't necessarily need that because, um, you know, it's, we've got other things to, to pay for and this is just too expensive to do. And so that's why it's taken so long to get some of these things through town meetings um, because it's, it's to, to uh, clean up the water that is for uh, protecting land values, maybe, and protecting the shellfish, yes, but, um, because you're, you're doing something about the habitat with the nutrient enrichment, the habitat for the shellfish is dwindling. So, well, okay, so the shellfish is dwindling. Okay, well, yeah, that's something that you know, we don't really want, but all of that to clean it up, all of that money, you know, it's just, it's just something that doesn't quite make it when it gets down to the, the P's and Q's of all the things. So, yeah, there's been a change of attitude, and it's taken a long time for people to understand that these are, these are all interrelated, that, that the, the waters, the, the keeping clean waters is helping everybody. It's helping the Cape economy, it's helping the land values, it's helping um, the tourists coming, it's helping everybody but you've got to take a harder look at it. And so sometimes people using, some of the towns are using shellfish as a cleaner upper. And that's at the end of the pipe, uh, it, and it helps a lot because shellfish can filter water and filter that nitrogen out of it. But it's still the beginning pipe of the pipe that needs the, the real um, heavy duty um, attention. And that's what's taken a long time to get that. The other thing is that there's a tremendous turnover rate in people on the Cape. People are coming and going all the time. And so it's constant education. You think you've got, you've got it down so that people understand it. And then there's a new crop of people <laughs> that come in because the land changes um, so frequently. Um, so you, you're always, it, it's always an education part of it. And it's, you, you, you know, keep saying this till you to you turn it blue, but it, it, it's got to re be repeated over and over and over and over of what the importance is and why it's important to the individual. Well, I'm, I'm trying to update swirling currents because so, many, so much has happened since this came out in 2018. So that's one thing. But I'm also trying to develop, or I am developing, an online course that tries to put some of these things into perspective for a wider audience. and. Um, Hopefully that is going to work. I'm, I'm hopeful for that one, that I can try and put these, connect these dots online for a course. <laughs> friends, of, friends of mine that I have reconnected with from junior high school say, they, they shake their head and they say, we always knew you were going to do this. This is what you've wanted from every, from when we, since all the time we've known you. I said, really? <laughs> Yeah, there was yeah, this there was no there was no hesitation. So, you know, I've just been I've just been tuned into the water for a very, all my whole life. So, all right, the, the things like the, um, the the town water quality task forces, the county water quality task force, those are all really important, and it, it's something that that the towns can do. And sometimes the towns don't think that public education is important; that the education should come from some other place. But the town shouldn't be paying for public education and I don't buy that especially here because I think that the public education about the environment is so important for everybody um, so you know that's that's my sort of mantra that it's 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 important it's not something that's just a, a um, uh, luxury I think that it's more than a luxury yeah it's not the it's not the police and fire but it's still is is important and Traditionally, shellfish usually get short shrift in budgets, so it's it's tough. It's tough to get it across, and I and I get it. I get it because it's it is something that that some people consider a luxury, but um, I don't. I, I think that it's really important for for everybody around to understand these things. And even if even if that's a, a small part of what I've been able to do, that I'm I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to try and do it. And um, 
you know, just, I, as everybody said, if I, when people say to me, you know, that I've done a lot or whatever, I said, just doing my job. <laughs> <laughs> just doing my job. <laughs> my job happened to be to love that place out there. I've also done a lot of travel by water, and I love cruises, and I love long cruises, and I love it. Uh, transatlantic or trans-pacific cruises those are my favorite because you're at sea for a long time and god i love them so i've done several of those in my life and they have been really worthwhile as well because then i get to see different areas and i can get to see what what is happening in areas i can see aquaculture going on in um spain or norway or you know wherever i am and it's just it's just been wonderful to see all these things. I had the, the marvelous um, life-altering experience that I was invited to participate in a people-to-people -people citizen ambassador program to China. And the invitation came and one of the selectmen was downstairs when I read, when I got the letter, I said, look at this. And she said, you know, this is great, Sandy, you know, you ought to go, but the town can't pay for it. I said, nor should they, it's not a town thing. <laughs> And they said, well, let's see if we can help you. And so she went up, went to the, the rest of the selectmen and said, we should help her do this. And they set up, swear, a Send Sandy to China fund. And donations started pouring in, and the townspeople of Orleans sent me to China. When was this? 1987. Yeah, it was two years before Tiananmen Square. Wow. 1987. That's incredible. Yeah, so it was, it was uh, China and Taiwan. So I saw aquaculture in um, China and saw this bay, I'll never forget it, this bay that had no, no boats like you'd see out there, not one recreational boat. And as far as you could see were lines of buoys, as far as you could see. And they were growing bay scallops. And when I went in there, I asked if they were our bay scallops and I was using the, the, the Latin generic name because I didn't think he would understand the English. And, but he didn't, he didn't pick up on the Latin either because they've got their own names for things. But I had a necklace on that happened to have a little scallop as part of it, a real scallop. And I pointed to my necklace and he said, oh, yeah, yeah that's, that's what we're growing. Whoa. So then I found out the story about how they got our bay scallops sent over to China to start their business. And it became a multi-metric ton in export for them. Wow. So, you know, it was huge to, to see that in person was just amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, and the oyster culture that they were doing and the, the pearl culture that they were doing, the oysters they were growing for pearls. And to see all of that, it was just, it was just amazing in a country like China before, um, before Tiananmen Square. So it was, but it was just, you know, you, you're being watched all the time, but it was, it was really, it was something else, and I'm I'm just unbelievably grateful to the people of Orleans that that did that for me. It was just it was a, like I said, the experience of a lifetime. Um, you asked me what I what I do now, and I talked about the books and the course. But I'm also a lecturer, and so when um, things come up, I can put together a lecture on one of these topics, no matter what it is. So I have one in the can about whales. I have one in the can about. Um, that's the other one I did lately. And anyway, there are several of them that, that are all set to, ready to go. So I, I'm, that's what I do also is I don't mind public speaking. In fact, I like it. Um, and, I, and I can break it down into these different parts of what I've written in, show, in Swirling Currents. You know, whales is, is, a, is a big topic no matter what you're talking about. Um, the seals and sharks is a big topic. Um, but... I can do each one of those and, and get that out to the public that way as well. The last one I gave was at the Tales of Cape Cod and a woman came up to me and said, I think I'm going to have to pay more attention to this now. And just that one comment made my whole year that one person I influenced in some respect to say, I got to pay more attention. And I thought, okay, this is good.